I'd like to speak this morning on uh, War of the Worldviews, Christianity versus its challengers. So I'd like to speak about uh, culture wars, if you like, between Christianity and the challengers will be naturalism and post-modernity. So the first challenger then is naturalism. And it's widely believed today that the only valid source of knowledge is science, that science has decisively disproved the biblical worldview, and that therefore belief in God is irrational. So the social consequences of that is that God no longer belongs in modern society. Uh, recently, there have been a number of books written on this theme. Richard Dawkins, you've probably heard of him from Britain, has written a book called The God Delusion, where he argues that uh, religion is just uh, a large delusion that uh, doesn't have any truth content. Uh, ten years earlier, he wrote that religious faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. So it gives you some idea as to where he stands. Now, in a poll in the UK uh, in 2006, it uh, turned out that 42% of the people agreed with this statement of Dawkins. Uh, meanwhile, uh, here in the US, uh, Christopher Hitchens has written a book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. So again, on the same theme. And both in the USA and in Europe, uh, intelligent design has been banned. So it's not even uh, just against creation, but also against intelligent design. Even if you believe in theistic evolution, uh, that has been banned. It's only purposeless evolution that may be taught in public schools. And there's a picture of uh, Richard Dawkins. Now the other challenger is post-modernity. And as we'll see later, this is sort of the logical consequence of modernity. Postmodernity believes that there's no absolute truths at all, that there's only human constructions, uh, human inventions that are passed off as truths. Again, God has no place in society. And uh, Steve Bruce has written a book, God is Dead, Secularization in the West. So these are the two prime enemies of Christianity. Now, is God dead? Uh, the question was raised more than 100 years already by a German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche wrote, uh, God is dead, we have killed him. A famous statement. Science has killed him. And then he went on to say that science has also killed truth. Once God is dead, then there's no room for truth either. So Nietzsche was the first uh, postmodern philosopher, if you like. Now, how did science kill God? It is alleged that science has falsified biblical miracles, and that scientific explanations make God unnecessary. So even though science was originally founded on, sci on Christian principles, so science was so successful in explaining things that it was thought that all, everything could be explained through a set of laws that had no exceptions, so no miracles. And that since we have natural explanations, we don't need God anymore to explain anything. And there's a picture of David Hume, a British philosopher from the 1700s uh, that had a systematic attack against theism as well. Now the question is raised, uh, is that argumentation valid? Can science really kill God in that manner? Now the myth that we're often presented with is that on the one hand we have science which is factual, objective, and rational, and on the other hand we have religion which is mythical, subjective, and irrational. And if the debate is set on these uh, premises, uh, then it always turns out that science will win and religion will lose. Now, in fact, however, if you look at the reality, then science is not quite as objective as is made out. In science, we have to distinguish on the one hand between the hard data, the things that you actually observe and see, 
stuff that you do in the lab. And on the other hand, uh, subjective theory, okay, how we explain what we see. So what I'm saying here is that there's a big jump between the data, what you see, and theory, the explanations of what you see. So one example, for example, if you look at galaxies, uh, you'll see a redshift. I looked at this more closely uh, this afternoon. Uh, what is the explanation for the redshift? So the data is quite straightforward. You look at the galaxies, they shifted towards the red. The further away they are, the greater the redshift. So the most common explanation is that this is caused by expanding space from the Big Bang. But if you look at the scientific literature, you'll find there's also other explanations. For example, it could be motion through space of the galaxies, a Doppler shift we would call that. Or if there's a gravitational source, uh, this will cause a redshift as well. Or if you have a decreasing speed of light, that will give you a redshift. Or instead of the universe expanding, if the universe stays the same size but the atoms in it shrink, you'll also get a redshift. Or if the particle mass increases, you'll get a redshift. Or maybe light just gets tired. So as light travels through space, uh, it's not as funny as it sounds. As light travels, it's going to hit particles, so it's going to lose energy. And if it loses energy, it's going to be shifted towards the red. The further it travels, the more redshift you get. So it, it's, uh, it makes sense in a way that, that you have the tired light theory. So here I've got uh, two, four, six, uh, seven different theories. You find these are all in the literature. And the question is, uh, which one is the correct one? And how can you prove that that theory is correct and the other ones are not? Uh, they're all consistent with the data. Okay, so the choice upon which you choose a theory has to be something that goes beyond the data, which means it's going to rely on philosophical factors. So how do we get from data to theory? That's the big question in science. So Carl Hempel, a philosopher of science, has written that transition from data to theory requires creative imagination. Scientific hypotheses and theories are not derived from observed facts, so it's not just a logical, rational operation, but they are invented in order to account for them. So it's very much like this painting from uh, Piet Mondrian, composition in blue, which, which evokes a sense of pattern, if you like, but there is a large creative element as well. Uh, here's one example. Here's a, a famous picture of a prehistoric man. But actually, this is just uh, an artist, artistic reconstruction, Nebraska man, 1922. Uh, this is the theory, if you like. Uh, what's the data upon which this actual painting was based? Well, there's the data. It was one tooth four different views of that tooth and it turned out that actually uh, this was the tooth uh, not of a man but of a pig so it turned out that everything in this picture that you see towards the left is just artistic uh, imagination there's there's no fact behind it at all so that's one difficulty in science how can we distinguish between what you actually see and what is actually presented there is another problem, and that is how can you ever disprove a theory? A theory is tested not just by itself, but also with other theories, so you can also always adjust the secondary theories so that your favorite theory is going to fit the facts. So a philosopher, uh, Willard Quine, wrote, any statement can be held true, come what may, if we make drastic enough adjustments elsewhere in the system. The totality of our knowledge is a man-made fabric which impinges on experience only along the edges. So what he's saying is that a lot of what is passed off as knowledge is theory, and the theory does touch the data at some points, but there's a lot of room there for other possibilities. Emer Lakatis, another philosopher of science, has written that scientific theories are not only equally unprovable and equally improbable, but they are also equally undisprovable. So what he means here is that you can never prove a theory because how do you know that tomorrow some data may come along that is going to be contrary to what your theory predicts? Uh, they're equally improbable because 
for any set of data. In principle, you can construct an infinite number of theories to explain the data, just like you can fit uh, an infinite number of lines through a finite number of data points. And so the probability of any particular theory being correct is one out of infinity, which is zero. And likewise, he says, you can never really disprove a theory because you can always fix up the theory with the auxiliary theories to make it fit the data. Now, that means that we have to make a choice at some point. Uh, that choice is going to depend upon your worldview. Okay, but, but how you look upon things. Have we jumped here? Let me just go back for a sec. For some reason, uh, I skipped a whole bunch of pages here. Okay. So how do we choose a theory? If we have uh, an infinite number of theories, uh, like for the redshift, which one of those theories should we choose? Uh, what's the best theory? Well, some people think that uh, the simplest theory is the best theory. Uh, but the question is, uh, how do you know that simple theories are more likely to be true than more complicated theories? Reality tends to be more complicated uh, than we would like it to be. So you may state that simple theories are the best ones, but to prove that is another question. Or, or you may want the best theories to be the most beautiful theory or the one that explains the most different things. Okay, but either way, you're going to have to justify that on a philosophical basis. And the, the difficulty is that we have no means of separating true theories from false ones. So we choose theories in practice uh, that fit in best with our worldview. And our worldview consists of our most basic assumptions about what the world is really like. So what I'm arguing here is that as far as science is concerned, only the observational data can be accepted as fact. Once you start to explain the data, to extend it into the past or the future, you have to rely upon theory. And this is where a subjective element comes in. So for example, into theory, we have uh, data coming in. There's also the imagination of the scientist. But a third factor on the right is one's worldview. So depending upon what your worldview is, you're going to leave out uh, certain theories of consideration and be more inclined to accept other ones. Now, what is a worldview? A worldview then has to do with the ba most basic questions of life. For example, who is God? What exists? Why does the world exist? What is man? What can we know? What should we do? And what can we hope for? Now, these are all very deep philosophical questions and uh, in we would call the first one, it has to do with religion. What exists has to do with metaphysics. Why does the world exist has to do with purpose or teleology. What is man? Anthropology. What can we know? Epistemology. What should we do? Ethics. What can we hope for? Eschatology. Now, these are philosophical type questions. Uh, most people don't think too much of philosophy requires hard thoughts. Uh, this is uh, most people's conception of uh, philosophy. Next time we have a philosophy department uh, party, let's go bowling. Philosophy has bad press nowadays, but the thing is that it does require, uh, these are philosophical questions that we're looking at. They do require deep thoughts, deep concentration. It requires hard work. And the fact is that your answers to the worldview questions that I raised, uh, they have uh, very many deep implications. So worldview answers do have consequences. Uh, here's a, a famous painting, uh, Liberty, uh, French Revolution. So here's one situation, uh, Liberty leading the people, where deeply held ideals led to very drastic action. Uh, I certainly don't agree with the deals of the French Revolution. 
Okay, but here we have a situation where we have a change in worldview in France uh, from Christian society to a very atheistic one. Uh, take a good look at this picture because the next one is very similar to it. Uh, this is a, a spoof of the first one. Note that Liberty has been replaced by Snow White and uh, Mickey Mouse. Uh, in the background there, you can't really see it from this diagram, but uh, on there it says drink Coca-Cola, Microsoft, uh, and so on. Uh, this is, i say, a spoof of the first one because this is a critique. If you have a worldview, then you have a set of values from which you can look at other worldviews and critique them. And this is a critique, if you like, of um, American uh, pop culture, which is very shallow. People don't do philosophy anymore. They just live for superficial pleasures. Uh, Mickey Mouse, Snow White, uh, as I said, uh, hedonism. Okay, there's no depth here. People just want to do their own thing and have fun. Now, the war with worldviews uh, is a reflection of what is called the antithesis. The antithesis has to do with a global conflict between faith and unbelief, between Christian and non-Christian worldviews. It has a long history. And the antithesis is behind the idea that science and culture are ultimately either God-glorifying, okay, the way they were meant to do originally, or God-defying, the way it usually is after the fall of man. And the main issue boils down to this. Does the Bible reveal absolute truth, or does it not? And if the Bible doesn't, so if God doesn't reveal absolute truths to us, uh, then how do we have any access to absolute truths? If you remove God, then you remove the source of absolute truths, and ultimately, as we'll see, this leaves you then to post-modernity where there is no truth at all. So ultimately, it's a question, the antithesis of a confrontation between God's word and Satan's deception. So thus says the Lord, we find that the first chapter of Genesis already. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And Satan's deception, did God say? That's the first question you find in the Bible in Genesis 3. Did God really say you can't eat of the tree? And then in Genesis 3, verse 15, we read, uh, God says, I will put enmity between your Satan's seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And this sets off then the conflict, the antithesis, if you like, between Christian society and a non-Christian society. So Tertullian, a Christian a theologian, on the year 200, uh, asked the question, what does Athens, the city of philosophers, have to do with Jerusalem? Okay, the city, if you like, of God. And Augustine wrote a very thick book, uh, The City of God, which I would recommend uh, for you to read. And in that, he talks about human history as dominated between a long battle or war between the city of God on the one hand and the city of man on the other hand. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote that there is no neutral ground in the universe Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. So the war, the antithesis, uh, covers everything. Abraham Kuyper, Dutch theologian, wrote, uh, it's not a question of faith and science or faith versus science, but of two scientific systems. We've got two scientific elaborations, each opposed to each other, each having its own faith. So it's never a question of science versus religion. That's what you read in the secular newspapers, but it's a, qu a question of uh, one worldview with its science versus another worldview which has its own science. Now, if you look at science, you'll find that there's two different types of science. Uh, we have, on the one hand, the science that most scientists so this is what I call operation science. This is the basic science that you do in the laboratory. It's concerned with repeatable events. 
It's uh, concerned with finding the laws underlying the universe uh, with applications. So this consists of most of science, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, all the science that you need for technology. It's justified under the cultural mandate of Genesis 1 verse 28. Okay, where man is told to subdue and replenish the earth. So to study the universe and to use it for the glory of God and for the benefit of mankind. On the other hand, we have what we can call historical science. So this is then speculative extrapolation to the distant past. So this concerns much of geology, astronomy, paleontology, and so on, archaeology. Uh, here the difficulty is not so, not so much with the data. As I said, the data is usually okay, but it has to do with the interpretation, and the interpretation then becomes highly worldview dependent. So observational science, I think we have a lot of common ground there, the actual stuff in the labs. But historical science, origins, explaining how things came to be, is a very different situation. So worldview plays a very large role once we get into the interpretation. So in dealing with origins, we have to remember that all observations are made at the present time. So any conclusions about origin have to rely on theory, on explanations of the data that we presently observed. No scientists were present at the beginning, so only God knows what really happened. So the origin debate is not about facts, but it has to do with how we interpret the facts, the proper interpretation. So not a question here of science versus Christianity, but naturalistic explanation versus Christian explanation. Now, what is a worldview? Let me look at this in a bit more detail. A worldview consists of presuppositions, okay, basic assumptions that we make about the universe, assumptions that we can't prove directly, so they're the nature of a presupposition, and a general framework, a story. So in Christianity, the story would be that God made everything, creation, fall, redemption. Uh, the naturalistic story would be evolution okay, from nothing. So worldview serves as uh, spectacles, as glasses, if you like. Depending on what kind of worldview glasses you have on, you're going to view the world differently. It's like having glasses uh, of different colors. If you have glasses that are rosy tinted, then life looks rosy. If your glasses are blue, then you interpret the world differently. And the question is, uh, if you're talking with somebody else, apologetics, who's wearing other worldview glasses, how can you convince that person that the world is really rosy and not blue? Because depending upon your worldview, you're just going naturally going to interpret things in such a way that you're so used to wearing these glasses that after a while you don't realize that you are wearing glasses. Everybody has a worldview, but not everybody is aware that they have a particular worldview, that what they see is in fact biased by certain deep-held presuppositions. So worldview is also a map Okay, it gives you guidance for life, it helps you to make decisions, and it gives you then a, a direction in which you want to go. Now, if everybody has a different worldview, wearing different glasses, how can you ever convince somebody that their worldview is wrong and that yours is correct? Well, not all worldviews are equal because there are certain properties uh, that a worldview should hold. First of all, it should be consistent. You shouldn't have presuppositions that contradict each other. So there should be some logical consistency. Your worldviews should be consistent also with experience because a worldview is there to explain your experience. So if your worldview tells you that you don't really have any experiences, Okay, then there must be something wrong with your worldview. If it, or if your worldview tells you that you can't have certain experiences that you do have, then again, you've got a problem. A worldview should be livable. For example, you could argue that language has no meaning, as postmodern philosophers will do. But how are you going to live that out when you drive your car on the highway? Are you going to disregard the highway signs? Or if you go to the store to buy medicine, 
Are you just going to pick anything up and say that you can interpret it any way you like? So you can't. So this way, here we have a situation where you may claim to have a particular worldview, but you can't really carry it through in practice. The worldview should also be able to account for common sense and for science. So if your worldview says that the only thing that exists is matter, well, then how can you explain uh, that scientists uh, think, for example, and make plans and so on? So let's look at naturalism. What kind of a worldview is it? What are the presuppositions? I've got a quote here from William Provine, historian of science. He writes, evolutionary biology tells us there are no purposeful principles of nature, no gods, no designing forces that are rationally detectable. Second, there are no inherent moral or ethical laws. Third, human beings are marvelously complex machines. Fourth, when we die, we die. That's the end. There's no hope of everlasting life. And free will simply does not exist. Evolution can't produce a being that is truly free to make choices. The universe cares nothing for us. Now, these are all, if you like, uh, sort of logical implications of materialism. And William Provine is quite straightforward then as to what the implications are. So ultimately, there is, uh, there's no meaning for humans. It's much like this painting here. It's called The Two Crowns. Uh, we see a, a Norman uh, conqueror, a king, wearing one crown. So he's conquered kingdoms. He's proud of himself. But in the background, uh, you can see the, the other crown, uh, Christ there on the cross, who uh, the king here is ignoring. But naturalism is very much the same. It, it can boast that it has done uh, various things, but whatever it does is based ultimately on Christian principles. If the Christian worldview was not true, uh, then uh, there wouldn't be any naturalists at all to speculate. Now, what are the naturalist presuppositions? Uh, the story, full evolution. The universe jumped into being from nothing. First we get energy, then we get uh, stars and planets, life evolves, and so on. There's only natural causes, so only the laws of physics and chemistry really hold. There's just purposeless materialism. Knowledge is just empirical knowledge, it's just what you see. And if you follow that through, that means that the only thing you should believe are facts and not theories, because theories are not empirical. There's no divine revelation. Man is just an accident, he has no soul. That's what you get from materialism, which means there's no hope for life after death. There's no universal norms in ethics or mathematics. A God may exist, but God is irrelevant. Uh, most naturalists, if you like, are not so much concerned with God existing, but that if God does exist, uh, that means we have to obey God. Uh, that is the problem, that people want to do their own thing. Now, in explaining reality, reality consists of three different worlds. There's a book by Roger Penrose, a well-known physicist in England, called Shadows of the Mind. He ends that book with a chapter called Three Worlds and Three Mysteries. Now, according to Penrose, uh, there's three different worlds. There's the world of matter. That's the world that you see if you look around yourself. The world of uh, okay, we that world has just disappeared. <laughs> so the first world is is the world of matter that you see, but there's a second world according to Penrose. Yeah, that is the world of ideas. That's your thought world your inner world, your beliefs, your desires, your hopes. So that's the world of the mind. And then there's a third world, and that is the world of absolute truth. So this would be a mathematical world, if you like. The world uh, where we have mathematical laws, where we have ethical norms and things of that nature. So those are the three worlds, and the question that, or the mysteries that Penrose deals with is the question, how do you ever get from one world to the other? 
Because if you look at the physical world, it seems to have um, a very high mathematical structure. All of the reality you can explain through about uh, six different uh, physical laws. So where did the structure come from? I'll just continue. I don't want to lose uh, time here. The second question is, uh, so how do you ever get from a mathematical world where you have these different possible universes uh, to the physical world? Because mathematics is abstract. The physical world is concrete. So how do you take a mathematical equation and make something concrete to come out of it? The second question is, uh, out of all of the possible mathematical universes, there's only one physical universe. So what made the choice? to choose one of those possible universes and to actualize it into the one that we actually see. The second mystery is how do you get from a material world of objects, matter, to a thought world? Atoms is one quantity, but thoughts about atoms are totally different. So how do you ever get from matter to mind? This seems to be a step that you simply can't make through evolution be because evolution just works on the material aspect, the laws of physics and chemistry, which deals with how things are. But your mind world works according to the laws of ethics and logic, so it deals with how things ought to be. And in philosophy, if you start off with statements of how things are, you can never get the statements of how things ought to be. It's, it's, it's a totally different category, if you like, that you can't make the jump from the one to the other. Now, the last difficulty, thank you very much. The last difficulty that we have is if you have this world of mind that evolved supposedly from matter, how is it that the mind can grasp mathematical truths? So how can the mind have access to that world that's out there somewhere? So these are mysteries to Penrose. He doesn't know how to do this because he's a naturalist. He doesn't believe in God. And according to Penrose, the real world is actually uh, this one here. So he claims the real world is the mathematical world and that both the physical world and the mind are just uh, illusions, if you like, or thin shadows of it. So, yeah, this is just a slide showing you uh, that if, if you have these equations here, six equations, that you can explain um, almost uh, anything having to do with physics uh, and chemistry and what is derived from it. So it's really marvelous that we have this, uh, this... See, if mathematics is something that's invented by men, how is it that you can have these six equations that can explain uh, almost anything that happens physically? It, it seems that it's just too good to be true. And that's why most mathematicians believe that mathematics is something that's discovered, not something that's invented. So they do believe that there is this mathematical world out there, like Penrose does, of which we somehow have access, but they can't explain how you can ever get access to it on a naturalist basis. So with naturalism, we've got problems then of getting from math to matter, from getting from matter to mind, from getting from mind to math, and we'll see later also with self-refutation. Let's go through these quickly. Uh, from math to matter, uh, why does the universe exist? Why does it have order and uniformity? Why is it mathematically intelligible? Why does it have a particular mathematical form, and how are these actualized? These are all tough questions for naturalism. Uh, from getting from matter to mind, uh, how can purposeless matter give rise to purposeful life? Where does the purpose come in? How can chance give rise to complexity? How did information arise? How can matter become conscious? Uh, if your brain consists of billions of neurons bouncing around, what gives you a sense of self, a, self of, a sense of unity? 
And how do non-physical factors, such as ethics, influence the mind and give you physical results through certain actions? So what transforms mental choice to physical actions? It's all tough questions from naturalism. Anybody recognize this famous bug? It's a Mandelbrot set. Yeah, this is a mathematics. So you have a very simple mathematical equation, and it generates this fantastic world. So you can zero in any point here and get more and more detail. And mathematicians have looked at that and said, well, this is, world must exist. It's not an invention, uh, because we're discovering properties of it that we haven't put into it. So. So the question is, uh, if mind evolved, why should we trust it? Uh, how can non-physical absolutes exist? How can is give rise to ought? I discussed that already. How do we access norms? Why is math applicable if it's something that's just invented? And we also have a further problem. Uh, Sir Francis Crick, he was mentioned a couple of times last night in connection with DNA. But he's also written a book uh, more recently called The Astonishing Hypothesis. And the astonishing hypothesis that he deals with in this book, uh, he discusses in the first uh, page, and he says the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, and so on, are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells. So basically what he's saying is that all of your thoughts and beliefs are illusions caused by nerve cells. Now, if you think about that, there's something strange about that statement, because if all your beliefs are illusions caused by brain neurons, as Crick believes, where does that leave Crick's belief <laughs> that all of beliefs are illusions? So what he's arguing is all your beliefs are illusions, but mine aren't. But he has no basis for that. There's another book uh, written by a naturalist um, called Living Without Free Will. Derek Parabohm, and he says, uh, given our best scientific theories, factors beyond our control ultimately produce all our actions. We are therefore not morally responsible for them. Because if what you're doing is determined by your brain, by the laws of physics and chemistry, why should you be responsible? So in this book, he says that we should be easy on criminals. We shouldn't punish them because they can't help what they're doing. Now again, that sounds a bit strange, right? Because if criminals can't help what they're doing, what about judges or philosophers? So if you follow that, so again, he's arguing like Crick and that uh, nobody can really think except for me. So you better listen to what I'm saying. So it's very much uh, <coughs> like this diagram here. This is a famous diagram of Escher. It's a waterfall. And if you look at any particular part of the picture, it looks quite reasonable. But if you look at the water, you find it goes down here, and then it goes down, 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 down. But suddenly, you're up here again. So there is an inconsistency in this picture. And the situation is much the same as with naturalism. Because if you put all the assumptions together, you have a problem. Because if you want to defend naturalism, if you want to argue with somebody that naturalism is true, then merely by arguing, you have to assume that we do have reliable minds, that there is such a thing as objective truth, that there are purposeful selves, that there are rational norms so that I can convince you, and so on. But all of these things are things that naturalism as a, a worldview uh, really denies that exists. So if you want to argue that naturalism is true, you really have to assume that naturalism is false. Why are we here? Provine said uh, there's no ultimate meaning for humans. Uh, Dawkins thinks that there is a meaning to life. Uh, we are machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. And that is exactly what we are for. It's every living object's sole reason for living. Well, then again, you might ask yourself, if your sole purpose for living is to make further copies of DNA, why is Dawkins wa wasting his time writing books? <laughs> he should be reproducing himself, right? <laughs> now, if you compare that to the Christian worldview, uh, Westminster Shorty Confession says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then you can see the contrast between the utility of naturalism and the richness of Christianity. So the basics of the Christian worldview is that uh, everything is created by God. Man fell into sin, and then the entire creation was distorted through that. But through Christ, there is uh, redemption and also ultimately restoration of the universe to what it was like before the fall and even richer.
So the metaphysics is that God is the ultimate reality. He's all powerful, all knowing. He sets the physical laws. God reveals truth to us through the Bible. We are created in God's image, not an accident, but to serve him, body and soul, and God sets all the norms. So the Christian view of the knowledge is that the physical world is upheld by God, therefore we can trust their observations. The Bible is inspired by God, therefore we can trust its message. Mathematics is upheld by God, and uh, therefore we can see the mathematical structure in the universe. But scientific theories, on the other hand, are fallible human constructs. And if they're going to be true, then they should at least agree with observation, logic, and the Bible, the God-given basics. So again, the great difference between theory and observation. And Christianity enabled science. So God said, let us make man in our image, be fruitful and multiply. So the cultural mandate provided motivation to study it. Belief in a rational God who man image made science feasible. So if we look at Penrose's three worlds of mathematics, mathematics is upheld in the mind of God. God made the universe according to a rational structure. Therefore, we see the mathematical pattern there. Man is created in God's image. Okay, and hence, we can comprehend it, and everything fits neatly together. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to skip over this. The Reformation stressed, again, the importance of everyday life, the importance of all occupations, and also the importance of looking at nature and observing it and going back to the basic data. If you look at the founders of science, uh, Francis Bacon, Johannes Kepler, Galileo, Newton, uh, these were all Bible believers. They all thought that they were discovering creation as God had made it, and they all praised the Creator in the writings, although most scientific textbooks today won't mention that. Science needs God. Paul Davies, he was mentioned yesterday, uh, also a uh, popularizer. He's not a Christian, but he says for 300 years, science has based itself on materialism leading to atheism and meaninglessness, as we saw. But even the most atheistic scientists accept as an act of faith the universe is not absurd, that it has a structure. So science can proceed only if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. So he grants that you need to have something like God upholding things to give you the uniformity that you need. Materialism is a belief that's granted uh, by biologists here. Uh, Lewontin writes, we take the side of materialism in spite of the absurdity of some of its constructs because we have a prior commitment to materialism. So he writes that no matter how silly these explanations are to be, we have to accept them because if we don't, then we open the door for theism, which is what we don't want. John Searle, a philosopher of mind, writes, how can we how can so many philosophers and scientists say so many things that seem obviously false? He's referring here to the fact that most philosophers of mind believe that you don't really have a mind because uh, your brain operates according to the laws of chemistry and physics. So how do ethical norms, for example, have a chance to do anything in your mind? So they believe that your thoughts are just like smoke that's thrown off by locomotive. Okay, your thoughts may be there, but they don't really do anything. They don't change any action that you do. Now, intuitively, this is false because we all experience the fact that we do make decisions. So he writes, how come so many philosophers and uh, scientists say, say things that seem false? Well, he says it's not so much because they're convinced that it's true, but that if you look at the alternative, it means that you have to accept God. It means that you have to accept some traditional traditional religious conception of the mind. And they don't want to do that. So Tom Nagus, Nagel, another atheist philosopher, writes about the fear of religion. He says, I speak from experience. I want atheism to be true. I'm uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. But it isn't just that I don't believe in God, it's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God because uh, if there is a God, then we have the problem of authority. Then you have to obey the God and you can't do your own thing. So that's why he 
supports atheism, and he says this supports the ludicrous overuse of evolutionary biology to explain everything about life, explaining, including everything about the human mind. The explanations may be absurd, but this is where you have to go if you want to avoid God. So it's like the Tower of Babel, a modern example. The basis uh, is human autonomy. Man wants to do his own thing. Knowledge comes from science. Uh, science gives you power in technology. The technology is driven by economics. It gives you wealth. Uh, the ex economics is driven by consumerism, which gives you pleasure. But ultimately, the whole thing deconstructs because once you do away with God, then you don't have any absolute truths anymore. You don't really have a language that you can communicate with. And just like the original Tower of Babel, everything collapses. So the issue is not rationality. Richard Rorty, a postmodern philosopher, writes, I do not think that Christian theism is irrational. I entirely agree it is no more irrational than atheism. Irrational is not the question, but rather desirability. Okay, we reject Christianity because we don't want to listen to God. So Paul Sartre, an atheist, writes, atheistic existentialism states that if God does not exist, the man is only what he makes of himself. But it's very distressing that God does not exist because all possibility of finding values disappears with him. Hence, man is forlorn. Neither within nor without does he find anything to cling to. So people want to construct their own worldview, if you like, but ultimately they find there's no meaning in it. Critical human reason, once uncorked, is like an asset that dissolves all absolute, and eventually human reason erodes its own foundation. And like Nietzsche said, uh, there is once God is dead, then truth is dead as well. So Nietzsche again wrote, God is dead, we have killed him, science has killed him, science has killed truth. Which reminds us of Corinthians, where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Bertrand Russell, famous atheist, right? The center of me is always the eternally a terrible pain, a curious wild pain, searching for something beyond what the world contains, something transfigured and infinite. Now Bertrand Russell is a great philosopher. If you read his book, The Problems of Philosophy, you'll find an excellent introduction to philosophy. But he's also written the book, Why I'm Not a Christian, which is very irrational. You read that and he's frothing at the mouth. Now the most tragic thing that happened to Bertrand Russell was that his daughter, despite her atheistic upbringing, turned out to be an evangel evangelistic uh, Christian. And she, his statement is in a book that she wrote about her famous father that although he rejected God, he was always frustrating because he was searching for something, a deeper meaning, which he had rejected by rejecting God. It's like Augustine writes, uh, the soul finds no rest until it finds it rest in God. Or Pascal, man has a God-shaped void that only God can fill. God created man for fellowship with God. And if man rejects God, he's left with the frustration of a quest for something transcending himself that he can never fulfill. So it's a long war against God. It was started in paradise. But because man, man wanted to be like God, Genesis 3, that was the temptation. But what happened was that once they reject God, God lets them be deluded. They exchanged God for a lie. God gave them up to a debased mind. They became fools. And Thessalonians talks about God should send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that all might be damned who believe not the truth but a pleasure in unrighteousness. So for Christian warfare, which is what we're dealing with here, uh, we have to be prepared. So Ephesians talks about that, put on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the bed, uh, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, and so on. That means that we have to, we have to study the word. We have to train ourselves in this warfare. This is an all-out war, the antithesis, that nobody can stand on the side. It's a war of ideas. So 2 Corinthians 10 talks about the weapons of our warfare, not of the flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the opinion of God and take every thought captive to Christ. So that means that we have to be very discerning, be conformed to 
you be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That means that when you read literature, you should look carefully at what are the hidden presuppositions. What is the worldview where they're coming from? You'll find that presuppositions are rarely stated up front. I've given you a couple of quotes here, but usually you don't find these quotes. Things are presented as true, which are not true. Uh, it's important to be consistent. Worldviews come as package deals. They come as systems. You can't just pick and choose one thing from one worldview and something else from a second worldview. We have to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So that means that in everything we do, we have to make sure that we're consistent. No man can serve two masters. So compromising Christianity with naturalism introduces an inconsistency that if you follow that through, it will eventually undermine our commitment to God. So we have to take every thought captive to Christ. So for apologetics, uh, that means there's two aspects of apologetics. There's a positive one, where if you talk with unbelievers, you should be able to explain the biblical worldview, to answer questions that are posed to you to clear up misunderstandings and so on outline how the biblical view offers a cohesive explanation of everything but there's also a negative aspect where you have to attack the unbelievers worldview you have to show deficiencies in other worldviews to unmask the foolishness of unbelief so this means that destroying the wisdom of the wise casting down every thought that rises itself against the knowledge of God. And what I'm talking about here is what's called presuppositional apologetics, uh, following the line of thought of Cornelius uh, Van Til. He's written a book called The Defense of the Faith, where he argues that we should stress the worldview presuppositions, which I've done here this morning, that we should show that the Christian worldview gives a coherent explanation of man and that the unbeliever's worldview makes nonsense out of history, science, and even reasoning itself. So this, uh, this is called a transcendental argument, and it's primarily a reductio ad absurdum of the believe unbeliever's worldview. You look at his presuppositions and show that ultimately, if he tries to defend that, he's going to refute himself. And that only the truth of Christianity can rescue meaningful logic, science, and morality. Otherwise, you can't get absolutes, which means you can't even get logic. So only Christianity provides the philosophical basis necessary for human reasoning and knowledge in any field. So my conclusions are, first of all, science is very much worldview driven. There is a large subjective element. That worldviews are based on presuppositions. That naturalism and postmodernity are ultimately self-refuting that Christianity gives coherence, meaning, purpose, and hope. So ultimately, it's a heart choice. Are we going to obey God and his word, or are we going to rebel against him? And the challenge that I'll leave you with is to articulate your worldview. So think about it. Uh, what are your most basic beliefs, presuppositions, and priorities in life? And then you should work these out consistently. Work out your faith in uh, fear and trembling. So worldviews, remember, come as package deals, as all-encompassing systems. So we should be consistent then in what we do and work out the complications. So again, compromising Christianity with naturalism will give us inconsistency. And that uh, is the end. Thank you.